coming back to Ontario isn't quite coming home, but it's coming back to, to family roots of a sort. And in case you're wondering how, you know, how does, uh, how does somebody who's from Jamaica have connections to Sarnia? I mean, Toronto, I think, is pretty clear. I think probably half of my relatives are probably in the, in the Toronto area somewhere, as, as they are for most Jamaicans. But the connection to Sarnia actually is interesting because it, 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 it's not unrelated to the, the, the story I want to tell tonight. My parents were born in Jamaica in very modest circumstances. And like most kids of their generation, going to school for them uh, was not just a means of education. It was uh, something you did competitively if you wanted to to go on uh, to a better life. And namely, if you wanted to pursue your education further, you had to win scholarships because even middle class parents in those days didn't have money to send their kids uh, onto high school education and certainly not onto university education. So my parents uh, won scholarships to study at the University of the West Indies, which at the time uh, was the University College of London, uh, University of London West Indies campus. And so there they met uh, in Kingston, the University of West Indies, the Mona campus, and got married. And my mother won a Commonwealth scholarship, which was a scholarship, probably in, in front of a Canadian audience, I don't need to explain what a Commonwealth scholarship is, but uh, she was able to go study anywhere in the world uh, to get her PhD. <clears throat> my father, who was also very bright, but not quite as bright as my mom, apparently, <laughs> won a scholarship and had to go take his scholarship at the Illinois Institute of Technology, which was in Chicago. So my mother decided, well, then I'll do my PhD at the University of Chicago. So off my parents went to graduate school uh, in Chicago uh, in temperatures very similar to the, the, the kinds of temperatures we're experiencing here today. And my sister was born. Uh, they were married at the University of West Indies and went on to graduate school. My sister was born in Chicago. So um, after my parents finished their PhDs in Chicago with my mother doing her lab work uh, during the day and my father doing his at night so they could basically raised my sister. Uh, my dad's first, my dad was a, did his PhD in chemistry. And his first job out of graduate school was working, I believe, don't quote me on the, on the, on the, on the company, I believe it was working for Benjamins, uh, which I think is based in Sarnia. But anyway, his first job was in Sarnia, Ontario, working in the chemistry industry, chemical industry. And so my brother was born. Uh, and at that, that, that point, we're talking about sort of the mid-1960s. So the mid-1960s was a very heady time, particularly if you come from the part of the world where I and my parents come from. Jamaica won its independence in 1962 uh, from Great Britain, and Barbados followed in 1966, and a number of other Caribbean countries uh, also achieved independence. Um, I, think, I believe Ghana was the first British colony to win independence in 1956. So this was a point in time where if you were people like my parents, if you had earned a PhD from the University of Chicago uh, in biology or a PhD in chemistry from the Illinois Institute of Technology, you wanted to go home. That, uh, that knowledge you'd acquired overseas to help build these newly independent countries. And so that's a long-winded way of saying my parents said goodbye to Sarnia, hard as that was. You know, it's hard for you to believe uh, maybe Sardis is maybe not that, exci that exciting of a place, but uh, they decided to go back to, to Jamaica. And they went back to Jamaica to help build what they thought was going to be a more prosperous future uh, and a way forward. And things took a very different turn. And it's the, the turbulent times of the early 1970s uh, in Jamaica uh, the turbulent times in many developing countries around the world, countries that were called third world countries. So Jamaica was part of that group of countries in which countries seeking independence, seeking to establish their own systems that they could in fact be uh, uh, self-sufficient countries was the context that a number of other countries around the world found themselves in, countries that were called third world countries. And what I want to share with you tonight is the story of how those countries, those third world countries, countries like my native Jamaica, uh, that found themselves in great economic difficulty, 
in Jamaica really starting in the mid-1970s. How many of those countries, and I'm sad to say Jamaica is not among the countries I'm going to be alluding to now, because Jamaica is still waiting for its turnaround, frankly. But how did many of those countries, the Brazils, the Indias, the Chinas, Mexico, South Korea, and many other countries of the world, third world countries, how did they turn themselves around and become the emerging markets that are driving global growth today? And really the three key lessons to take from these former third world countries. Third world countries that turned themselves around and became the emerging markets of today did so by employing three basic principles that I want you to remember. And those principles are discipline, clarity, and trust. And what I want to do with my, uh, our time here tonight is I want to sort of open the conversation, and Domenico and I will continue it later on, by explaining what do I mean exactly by discipline, clarity, and trust in the context of economics. Illustrate that with a few stories uh, from both the third and the first world, or the developing world and the first world, and hopefully stimulate some thoughts about what it is that advanced economies, and in particular, the United States, Western Europe, can learn by adopting these principles, or, and I should emphasize, by relearning these principles that we, in the first world, through institutions like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the United States Treasury, taught developing countries, third world countries, for many decades, beginning in the mid-1970s about how to turn their economies around. So, discipline. Discipline, first of all, does not mean fiscal austerity. In today's environment, and let me say a bit about today's environment, but in today's environment, we tend to equate discipline with fiscal austerity. And that's not what, what discipline means. And I'll say a word about today's environment in just a second. Discipline means, rather, a sustained commitment to what I call a pragmatic growth strategy that's both vigilant and flexible. So emphasis on the and, vigilant and flexible. And it values what's good for the nation as a whole over what's good for any individual, interest group, or person running for political office. Now, if you think about where we are today, the global economy is growing, this year predicted to grow at roughly 3%, a little bit less. In 2007, the height of the boom period, the global economy is growing over 4% per year. So growth has slowed substantially. And the reason why this matters is because growth is what drives employment, and employment drives dignity. So if we're thinking about the impact of economic policy, and I'm going to be talking about the impact of economic policy in particular, I'm going to talk about discipline just a second again. The reason discipline matters, don't just think about GDP, but GDP matters because it affects whether people have jobs, whether they can provide for their families, and ultimately, whether they have dignity. And that's really at the heart of turnaround. Uh, the story that Fred alluded to earlier, which is in the book, is really a story about um, my first lesson in economics that took place on my grandmother's porch in Jamaica at the age of eight years old. Witnessing in that Jamaican context what happens when people can't provide for their families and what that it does to their dignity. But so come back to the first world for a second. Discipline doesn't mean fiscal austerity. In the, United, in the context of the United States, or the context of Western Europe, we've come to equate discipline with 
the willingness to adopt extreme measures. So sequestration in the context of the United States, radical fiscal consolidation, radical cuts to the budget. Uh, in the context of Europe, thinking about the rapid switch from gradual stimulative fiscal policy in Europe at the onset of the, of, the, of the crisis in 2008, 2009, to a radical switch to fiscal consolidation at the instigation of uh, Germany and, uh, and the European, uh, European Commission starting in 2010. But that's not what discipline means in a fiscal context. In a context of fiscal policy, discipline is actually no more complicated than the story of the ant and the grasshopper. So for those of you who are light on your bedtime reading lately, uh, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about bedtime stories because I have four kids. The story of the ant and the grasshopper, just to remind you, is that during the summer months when the agricultural economy, if you will, of, the, of Aesop's world was booming, the grasshopper decided to have a party and consumed heavily out of the grains of the field and didn't put anything away. The ant, on the other hand, decided that it would save and put away the grain from the fields so they would have something to consume during the winter. And consequently, during the winter, the grasshopper went hungry and the ant was able to basically run down its fiscal surplus. So if we come to an economic setting, and away from Aesop's fables. How does that translate? Well, think about the following example. Chile is what I call an example of a third world ant. And the United States is an example of what I call a first world grasshopper. What do I mean? Well, in the United States, in 1999, we ran a record fiscal surplus. It was about $236 billion. And the following year, we ran another fiscal surplus, I believe another record fiscal surplus. Then we had an election in the United States. We had an election uh, between uh, George W. Bush and Al Gore, and George W. Bush won that election. And as a consequence of winning that election, uh, instigated, instilled uh, a major tax cut package. He said, the fiscal surplus is the people's money, and we're gonna give it back to the people. And so we got a major tax cut package in 2001. And then we had September 11th, a series of wars, and serial deficits that were built in structurally because of the tax cut. First world ants. And, and just let me be very clear, I'm not making a partisan point here. Had Gore, Al Gore won that election, Vice President Gore, you can make a very plausible argument that the fiscal situation in the United States might have looked very similar over the next decade, but instead of having deficits resulting from tax cuts, we would have had deficits running from increased spending. So the point is not whether we had a Democrat or Republican in office in the United States, but that we made a decision not to save the fiscal surplus. That's the ant of the story. Contrast, Chile. Chile in uh, the early 2000s experienced an economic boom. Uh, Chile's major export is copper. And uh, during the early 2000s, uh, uh, world commodity prices were booming, copper prices in particular were booming, and Chile did very well. In 2006, uh, Chile had a record uh, fiscal surplus. I believe, I, I believe that the, the, the surplus of the Treasury swelled something like $36 billion. And the people of Chile took to the streets of Santiago. They took to the streets of Santiago and burned in effigy Andres Velasco, who at the time was the finance minister of Chile. Why did they burn Velasco in effigy? They wanted him to give them their money back. He said, give us the money. We've got a huge surplus. Spend the money on the Chilean people. 
Vlasic said no. This is money for a rainy day. We don't know when we're going to need this. And so he took the hit to his popularity. And two years later, global financial crisis hit. Chile was able to institute a multi-billion dollar tax cut package in the depths of the dark days of the Great Recession to stimulate the economy and to cushion the blow of the global financial crisis on the poor in Chile. So that's a third world ant. Great contrast between the way Chile handled their fiscal policy and the way the United States handled their fiscal policy. Discipline in the context of fiscal policy is really no more complicated than that. Throughout the book, I illustrate other examples of discipline at work. Now, one of the things I should have said to begin with is, well, how do we know what discipline looks like? How do we know? And one of the really challenging things when you actually look out in the world, you know, the fight over what discipline means didn't start with the battle over sequestration in the United States. It began way back uh, in the 1970s and 1980s in that worldwide discussion about economic policy that began taking place as countries um, like Jamaica and others were trying to forge their way economically. And in particular, in, uh, in 1985, we're back up three years, in 1982, Mexico, Mexico in August of 1982, made a declaration that it could no longer service its external debt. And this triggered something called the Third World Debt Crisis. Three years after Mexico signaled its inability to pay its debt, a very important meet, set of meetings was held in Seoul, South Korea in 1985. In October of 1985, there was a meeting, a set of meetings of the World Bank and the IMF, the annual meetings. <coughs> and at those meetings, then Secretary of the United States Treasury, James A. Baker III, went on behalf of his boss, Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan, the United States government, to outline a speech, give a speech, on what he believes constituted economic discipline. And in that speech, it was called a program for sustained growth. Baker outlined what the United States Treasury, the World Bank, and the IMF believed that Mexico and other third world countries needed to do to grow out of their debt and start seizing a more prosperous future. And yes, on that list was what needed to happen with respect to fiscal policy. But on that list, there were also a number of other things related to economic policy, related to trade policy, the role of the state in markets, the role of foreign capital in economic development, and so on and so on. And so when Baker unveiled this list of reforms, which later came to be known as the Washington Consensus, in this context of newly independent countries, now fallen into great debt, as a result of, in many cases, economic policies that were not particularly wise, being told by the US government, essentially, and the international financial institutions what they thought that third world countries should do to get out of the crisis, was, this list of ideas was not particularly well received. And the battle over what discipline means in the context of economic policy, from fiscal policy to the other items that I mentioned, became a very heated political discussion. And so one of the things that I do in turnaround is to say, these questions are far too important to, be, to divide us along political lines. Because what's at stake? It's employment and dignity, as I mentioned earlier whether people eat or don't eat, whether people live or die. And therefore, we need an, eff a way, an effective way of understanding what's discipline fiscal policy, 
what does discipline look like in the context of trade policy? And so how do we get a sense of that? Well, I argue in the book, ironically, the most useful tool in many ways to understand what efficient policy looks like is to look at how the stock market in these same third world countries responded when governments made decisions to implement economic policy changes that were on that list of things that Baker outlined. So ironically, understanding what's the best set of policies to help the poor, in many respects, comes from actually looking at what people believe to be, in some sense, a rich man's barometer, the stock market. But the reason why the stock market is important, the stock market doesn't care about where you stand politically, it doesn't care about ideology. It only cares about whether a policy change is likely to create or destroy value in the economy. And so if policies are expected to make the marketplace more profitable, expected to reduce interest rates, expected to reduce risk, then that policy change will be favorably received by the stock market. Because the stock market is forward looking. It asks, what will this impact of policy be, not just today, but into the future? And so you might be asking yourself, well, why does this matter for the poor or for workers if all these policies do is drive up valuations for shareholders? Well, it matters because policies that create value for firms make investment, real investment, not investment in stocks, but investment in physical assets, buildings, plants, factories, equipment, more attractive. As valuations go up, the cost of raising capital for firms goes down. And as firms invest in new equipment, workers become more productive. The demand for labor goes up. And that tends to drive up wages and employment. So good policies, policies that are good for business, are a necessary but not sufficient condition to create the conditions for prosperity for society more broadly. So when I say, what does discipline mean in the context of fiscal policy, and I talk about the ant and the grasshopper, I just want you to know that underlying what I've just said are 35 years of historical data looking at how the stock market responds to fiscal austerity, for instance, implemented in the context of developing countries. That's what I'm basing that statement on. So moving from discipline then to clarity. Remember I said there are three principles, discipline, clarity, and trust. Countries that turn themselves around, third world countries that turn themselves around did so once their leaders demonstrated a clear commitment to a change of direction. The story I want to share with you here comes from an island that's even smaller than the one that I come from. It's a story from the island of Barbados. So in 1992, Barbados was on the verge of economic collapse. Barbados had maintained a fixed exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar since the early 1970s, about 1.7 Barbadian dollars per US dollar. And Barbados is very, very heavily dependent on tourism and had built a very strong economy, uh, not just on tourism, but largely based on tourism. Uh, tourist visitors from places like Canada, the United States, and Great Britain uh, in the post-independence period. But in 1982, the United States was suffering from the savings and loan crisis and North America was in recession, and Barbados was having a hard time paying its foreign debt, it was running out of foreign exchange. So the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, sent a team of economists to Barbados to tell Barbados what it ought to do to avoid running out of US dollars, essentially. And the IMF's recommendation was, you needed to value the currency. Instead of it being 1.7 Barbadian dollars to the US dollar, perhaps it should, it should be two or 2.1. The leadership in Barbados said, we don't like this idea very much because 
our fixed exchange rate is our way of keeping inflation low because if we devalue the exchange rate, everything that we import from cornflakes to cars is going to be more expensive and workers are going to understandably ask for pay increases. And if workers ask for pay increases, then employers are going to then pass on those pay increases to consumers, and we're going to get into a wage price spiral. So we don't want to do that. But unlike what typically happens in other countries when the IMF makes a recommendation, the government doesn't like it, for instance, in, say, Greece or other European countries during the, uh, the recent um, IMF involvement, the leadership of Barbados did something radical. They pose an alternative solution, a viable alternative solution. And the proposal that they put on the table was, we will negotiate a wage cut amongst the workers. And the logic was, if we cut, there's, a, there's an amount by which if we cut wages by an, an amount that's equivalent to the size of the devaluation, well, we'll, we'll reduce costs. And if we reduce costs, that's just a good, that's, a, that's as good a way of reducing the cost of um, coming to Barbados to take a vacation. And we'll restore our competitiveness that way. So the problem with that approach, of course, is no one likes having their wages cut. Raise your hand if you want a wage cut tomorrow. <laughs> so what did they do? The Prime Minister, Erskine Sandiford, convene three-party talks between the government, the private sector, and the labor unions. And that fall, October of 1992, they convened talks, and they came to an agreement essentially by plebiscite. That basically, they sent out uh, 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 a ballot to the workers saying, you've got two choices. You could either accept a wage cut of roughly 10%, or we can devalue the currency. That's called the choice between Scylla and Charybdis. By a very slim margin, the workers voted for a wage cut. The government moved forward with it, and very quickly, roughly 30,000 people marched on the streets of Bridgetown in protest of the wage cut. Now, 30,000 people may not seem like a lot, but you have to remember, there are about 250,000 people in the entire island of Barbados. So this is 12% of the population. This is you know, the rough equivalent of 40 million people marching on Washington to protest having their wages cut. So this is a society about to come apart at the seams. So what happens? To their credit, the leadership came together. The head of the labor unions, Sir Leroy Trotman, Sir Leroy Trotman, went to the, his workers and basically said, we can't have this. We've got to do something. We can't destroy the country. And so he brings the workers back to the table. The Prime Minister reconvenes the talks. And very importantly, the private sector decides to get serious. They come back to the table and open the books up to the workers because, by the way, it's not very good for the hotel business to have 30,000 people marching in the streets. No one wants to go on vacation in a place where the streets are filled with protesters. So, the, so the, the private sector says, we'll open the books, and guess what? If the workers will accept the wage cuts, both um, public sector wage cuts and private sector wage cuts, we will agree to give future wage increases that are in line with productivity increases. In other words, we'll share the gains with the workers. So this does the trick. The Anglican Church even gets involved and to mediate, but they're able to, to get this bargain to hold. And as a result of this agreement, this tripartite wage agreement, the stock market takes off, goes on a record increase over the next six months. The real economy recovers over the course of the next year, and Barbados averts disaster. For his troubles, Prime Minister Sandiford and his party were kicked out of office following year. Um, his party did not 
returned to power for 14 years. Prime Minister Sanford never again was prime minister. When asked, in retrospect, did he pay too high of a price? His response was, the price that I paid was a small price to save the country. That's clarity. So discipline, clarity, and I want to come now to trust, which is the last point that I'll make, and then we'll, um, we'll have our discussion. Discipline and clarity produce trust, and trust is essential because markets move at the speed of trust. In a market economy, what we call arm's length transactions, transactions that take place whether in financial markets or markets for goods and services, need to be able to take place between anonymous individuals, people who don't know each other, who aren't neighbors. That's what we mean by arm's length. But in order for that to happen, people have to trust the market institutions. And discipline and clarity produce trust in markets that allow a market economy to function. And we find ourselves at a point in time in which there's great distrust, a lot of mistrust in markets, and a lot of mistrust, frankly, between citizens and their governments. But what I want to put in front of you for your consideration this evening is that in many ways, the lack of trust between advanced country governments and developing country governments is a key obstacle to our continued shared prosperity. So for as much talk as there's been about fiscal deficits, what I like to call the trust deficit between emerging markets and advanced nations is one of the greatest obstacles to future prosperity. What do I mean? Let's talk for a second about global governance, which is an appropriate thing to do at CG, I think. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, those institutions that were at the heart of the Washington Consensus, the uproar, the fight over economic policy that began after Baker's speech in 1985, in spite of all the changes that have happened in the emerging world, as they've gone from being third world countries to emerging markets, in spite of all the economic progress they've made, 20 million people lived out of poverty in, in, in Brazil, millions more in China, growth rates that have gone from 3.5% per year uh, between 1970 and 1984 to 5.5% per year between 1985 and 2007, sorry, 1995 and 2007 in emerging markets. In spite of all these changes, these countries still find themselves vastly underrepresented at the international institutions I just mentioned. So for example, the BRICS, the so-called BRICS of the world, Brazil's, Russia's, the Indian, India's and China's of the world, account for roughly 21.5% of global GDP. But at the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, they account for only 11.5% of the voting shares. In contrast, the countries, the European Union, account for roughly 24.5% of global GDP and 32.5% of the voting shares. So there's a great imbalance relative to size and importance in global GDP. This represents GDP shares from roughly 1945, but there's been dramatic change. And so the, the lack of reciprocation, the lack of recognition of the major role that emerging markets are now playing in the global economy is a major obstacle for the following reason. In the absence of changes, the BRICS have decided that they're gonna set up their own development bank. So this past spring, I believe it was in April, made a decision that they're gonna set up their own development bank. Now you might say, what's wrong with developing countries setting up their own development bank? Well, in principle, nothing. But it's the spirit of saying, essentially, if you won't recognize us, we're going to do our own thing. That is a sentiment 
that if allowed to continue to flirt, to grow, has the danger of leading to bilateralism as opposed to multilateralism and trade agreements, more resentment, protectionism, and a view of the world which frankly is a zero-sum view rather than a positive-sum view. Now it should be said, I should say, that in 2010 in South Korea, the G20 met and approved IMF reform. The G20 finance ministers and central bank governors all agreed that it would be a good thing to move two of the 24 voting shares, two of the 24 seats on the IMF executive board from Europe to the emerging markets. But this hasn't happened. Why? Well, in order for IMF reform to go through, it has to be ratified by 85% of the shareholders. The shareholders of the IMF are the roughly 160 countries of the world. There's one very large shareholder in the IMF called the United States. It holds 17% of the voting shares. 100 minus 17 is 83, which means the United States has veto power. The United States, in, in particular, the House Committee on Finance and Trade, chaired by Congressman John Campbell of California, has said that any discussion of IMF reform, which requires a quota increase on the part of the United States for complicated reasons, it's essentially just a rebalancing of the paid in capital of the uh, International Monetary Fund, any quota increase by the United States must be tied to the sequestered budget debate. Even though in April of 2009, the current administration set aside roughly $64 billion, more than enough to cover the quota increase, as emergency funding for the IMF in light of the financial crisis. So money that's in effect already been set aside for the purposes of supporting the IMF is not being made available and used effectively to prevent IMF reform from going through. So we have domestic politics standing in the way of global prosperity. The trust deficit matters. Why does it matter? Because the reforms, the discipline, the clarity, and trust in a domestic context that governments in emerging markets have worked, in many cases, so hard to build over the course of the last two and three decades to drive that turnaround from 3.5% growth in emerging markets to 5.5% growth. That increasing growth that drove up employment and pulled people out of poverty. More reforms have to happen. So the story here is not that emerging markets have arrived and in that in the, in the advanced nations are on their way down. The point is we all need to rise together. And the only way to rise together is if the advanced nations of the world adopt the humility to get outside of themselves and look at third world countries and look at the lessons of third world countries over the past three decades and realize that we need to have discipline, clarity, and trust in everything from monetary and fiscal policy to other domestic reforms. And if emerging economies continue down the road of reform they started so many years ago. But in order for emerging economy leaders to do that, to apply discipline, which says doing what's right, good for the country as a whole, in spite of difficult domestic political trade-offs, that requires political capital. <clears throat> and it is very hard to continue down a road of reform that came to the emerging world initially from the first world if the first world won't embrace and give emerging markets, frankly, their responsibility on the global stage. So that is why the trust deficit matters. So just to wrap up then, third world countries turned themselves around, became emerging markets, the ones that did, by adopting discipline, clarity, and trust. In order for advanced economies, first world countries, and third world countries to seize a more prosperous future for all of us, 
to go from 1.2% growth in the advanced economies back to something resembling trend growth, which is closer to 2%. We need emerging economies to continue to grow. In order for them to continue to grow, they need to continue with discipline, clarity, and trust. In order for advanced economies to get back on track, we need discipline, clarity, and trust. So we all need to adopt these principles in order to have a more prosperous future. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to what Domenico has to say. Thank you very much, Peter. It's uh, really a pleasure to welcome uh, you here at CG. Um, actually, uh, you know, I read uh, your book uh, twice. You know, uh, I read it uh, the first time when God bless it came you. out. Um, <laughs> And I found, uh, you know, already a number of points uh, and lessons uh, that uh, can be taken away. But, uh, you know, in preparation for this, uh, for this meeting, I was uh, going through your book again. And actually, I found a lot more points, even more than the ones you summarized here for, uh, for us. Um, and I'd like to push you a little bit further on some of the um, issues uh, that we did in the book. Um, let me first say that uh, uh, you know it is not uh, uh, common for you know economists to be able to summarize so effectively uh, lessons from uh, uh, policies uh, um, that have been implemented really uh, everywhere um, um, in the globe, from Latin America to Asia to Europe uh, to the Caribbean, and uh, you do that uh, very uh, effectively. And uh, also, um, clearly, your um, line is uh, always scientifically grounded, but uh, at the same time, uh, the way you underpin your uh, thesis is always very accessible. And I think this is really one of uh, uh, the strongest features uh, of this book. But, uh, um, you know, on top, of, you were mentioning discipline, clarity, trust. Actually, as I said at the outset, I do see there is uh, a lot more in your book. Mm. And uh, so, first of all, um, if uh, uh, you know, economics is a science, definitely the um, you know, economic policy making is an art. And uh, this means that you know, some, some very often uh, you know, there are more failures than successes. Yeah. And very often, successes actually originate from failures. And I think this is really the thrust, or at least in my understanding, this is the main thrust of your book, where you know, the fact that the so-called third world is providing lessons to the first world, that does not uh, arise uh, out of um, uh, you know, being right in uh, their own vision of the world. But actually, this, this is really the outcome of a long experimentation of pain, of uh, um, um, really um, uh, failures. And uh, also, uh, it's about uh, uh, being brave. Um, one of the, I would say, one of the main takeaways from your book is really pragmatism. And pragmatism uh, should not be understood as a way of weakening discipline. Mm. And by the way, I like very much the way you frame discipline, because it really dispels one of the uh, common myths of uh, pop economics that uh, you know, if uh, you believe in discipline, you have to undertake fiscal austerity. And uh, I think you know, from uh, the Eurozone, from other experiences that you laid out in your book, this is certainly um, uh, not true. So coming back to my point about pragmatism, essentially, uh, you know, just uh, borrowing uh, from uh, the, sa the sailing world, uh, you know, if there is a wind shift and you change your tack, it doesn't mean that you're being inconsistent. It doesn't mean that you're not going to reach your, uh, your target. If anything, this is going to increase the likelihood uh, for you of uh, reaching your target. But you have to be a little bit um, uh, creative on that. And I was very much impressed by the story you recall about China. Mm -hmm. And uh, you recall a story uh, about a very, uh, you know, a small village in mainland China in the uh, late 70s, after the 30-plus uh, year of uh, Mao Zedong leadership. Uh, you know, of course, this was a very different China from the country right. we know it today. And uh, there was a very, uh, you know, a small uh, communal farm where they uh, sort of, uh, uh, 
you know, decided to introduce a kind of profit sharing mechanism, mm -hmm. if uh, you know you allow me this yeah. uh, this term. And uh, you know, in the end, um, the fact that they experimented with that, um, you know, allowed uh, um, uh, you know to introduce a, a very a significant reform in the Chinese economic system from that very small village. You mentioned that uh, in the six years following that small experiment, uh, China gained a 60% um, increase in its income in the period from 78 to 84. And of course, there was a big uh, improvement, a tenfold improvement in productivity in the two decades uh, uh, that, that followed. So this is just to, under, to, to underscore the fact that uh, you, know, you need to experiment. And sometimes I think the economists uh, tend to be a little bit rigid in their uh, framework. Uh, and uh, this is uh, then um, uh, sort of escalated by um, you know, um, ideology, politics, uh, and so on. Um, you know, in, in, another um, takeaway uh, from, from your book is really uh, ownership. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe you uh, refer to that a number of times uh, in your book. You can, uh, the international community sometimes, you know, in order to mean, uh, well, you know, tries to impose or to sort of advise a certain receipt. But in the end, if the receipt is not felt by the country, there is no way that uh, it's going to succeed. And, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned the history of uh, Chile. They had uh, three IMF programs uh, in the course of the 80s, mm -hmm. and all the three programs essentially failed in the main objective of uh, um, uh, reducing inflation in the country. And then it was only when the central bank sort of autonomously, autonomously decided uh, to move forward uh, that the, um, uh, in the end, you know, the country was able to stabilize inflation. Um, finally, two more lessons. So we said pragmatism, uh, ownership. Two more lessons I would take away is humility. Mm. And of course, you need to be humble. And I think it, it is this uh, uh, being humble that in a way, uh, you know, enables uh, emerging economies, developing economies to uh, provide, uh, you know, a lesson uh, to the uh, so-called first world. And uh, um, finally, I would say uh, leadership. And you know, this is leadership as much as in the developing world as it is in the um, so-called first world. Uh, you recall in the book uh, the um, leadership of uh, former US Treasury Secretary Baker. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, that gave rise to the so-called uh, um, Baker uh, plan, a Brady plan. Essentially, uh, you know, the US was willing to support Latin, some Latin American economies in their adjustment in exchange for reforms. Right. And uh, um, I think, you know, if, you, if we look at Europe right now, yeah. uh, <laughs> we see that, uh, you know, economies do not thrive in a vacuum. So uh, we see fundamentally, you know, a lack of leadership. And I think to some extent that might, might also be true of uh, other countries. Um, even in the US, um, uh, you were mentioning the case of uh, you know, the IMF reform, and the US was very, the US administration that you advised early on was very much instrumental in forging a deal that is commonly referred to as the Seoul package. Mm -hmm. It's an IMF governance reform package that was endorsed at the G20 summit in Seoul. But then, ironically, uh, you know, the country that was so instrumental in moving forward and pushing for that package is now causing uh, the deadlock because uh, the US Congress, as you mentioned in your remarks, uh, is not, uh, is not uh, essentially uh, ratifying uh, that very package. And I think that this uh, has uh, far-reaching implications that go well beyond the IMF. Uh, because in a way they break the social contract mm. embedded in the G20. Essentially when the G20 was elevated at the leader's level, uh, starting uh, with the Washington summit of November 2008 and then the London summit of April 2009, the implicit contract that the so-called uh, advanced economies or first word uh, offered to the emerging uh, economies was uh, 
essentially we're going to provide you with more, um, you know, more say, more voice in the international uh, fora. And in exchange for that, you're going to take more responsibility. And uh, maybe on that, I'd like you to push a little bit further. Um, you do talk a lot about China, of course. Um, uh, China has uh, undoubtedly benefited from uh, the world economy. Um, but uh, it is also true that uh, you know, China, China right now is, not, uh, uh, is really one of the main actors. And uh, China so far is mainly benefiting from the system. But I think you know, if you are a leader in the world economy, you also have uh, you know, a stake in underpinning its prosperity, its stability. And this is a little bit, uh, you know, what the U.S. has done in, uh, would say, in the modern era, starting from the Bretton Woods Conference and the Bretton Woods Order, where really underpin a system where, I would say, you know, uh, uh, several economies uh, have, uh, have developed, have thriven. So, uh, you know, how do you see the role of China going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. So let me, let me first say that thank you for, for, for reading the book twice. You've, written, you've now read it two more times than my wife has read it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is great, by the way. She's, she's, she, 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 she knows what's in the book. Um, and knows many more things beyond that, actually. Um, and without her, the book would never have gotten written. But, um, but seriously, um, you make a very good point. I think that if you're going to be a major player in the global economy, uh, at some point, you have to provide what we call some global public goods. And it's not only in the world's interest for you to do that, but it's also in your own interest to do that. And I think you very eloquently kind of frame what I'm referring to as the trust deficit in another light, where it's in a kind of like turning the facet of the, of, of the diamond, uh, which is to say that we must give countries more responsibility so that they can no longer hide behind the excuse of not having a say, right? Um, there comes a point in matur of maturity of your place in the global economy uh, if you are the world's second largest economy whether, or, or if you're Brazil, not just, just China, where instead of being the voice of contrarianism, uh, the rebel voices, as Fred put it earlier, the voice of rebellion, you now have to be part of the group and show that you can lead rather than just instigate um, the need for change from the outside and actually propose, you know, like in the case of Barbados, alternative solutions. And so I think we are at this next natural stage. And the question is whether we can have the humility and also to, 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 to bridge this trust gap. And then I think we've got, it's incumbent on us as advanced nations to take that first step forward uh, or to extend the hand and then to see what, um, what the emerging economies will do. Because if we don't do that, uh, we're gonna continue to have this sort of seething relationship, this lack of trust. And these other countries don't ever get a chance to fulfill the social compact. Yeah, it's interesting because um, a few, um, you know, a couple of months ago, um, I was with uh, some of my CG colleagues in St. Petersburg at the G20 summit. And uh, I think that was the first time ever that the BRICS economy, which you mentioned, actually uh, gathered at the margins of the G20 summit and issued their own communique. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is more uh, to what extent they try to sort of stick together just to uh, increase their bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the advanced economies, or they have a common, a common agenda. And uh, to me, I think uh, this is still unclear. Maybe it might be unclear also to uh, the BRICS economies themselves. Maybe uh, you have some further thoughts on that. No, I think you're right. I think it remains to be seen. I think, I, I think a big element of it right now certainly is um, we're not being allowed to play uh, at the same table on the same field as everybody else, or at least in the same way. And so we're gonna get attention. You know, I've, I have four children and four boys at home. And you know, when you're, when you're not part of the conversation, you tend to make trouble off in the corner. And I think there's a certain element of that. And I, I think there's responsibility both ways there. 
it's both incumbent on, on the advanced nations to say, hey, wait a minute, come back into the conversation. No, you're too big. Um, you're too advanced at this point in your economic development to be off in the corner, you know, playing your own game. But those, uh, the BRICs also are rightly saying, well, give us the responsibility. And so I think there's a bit of a, a, bit of a game of chicken being played. And I think it's in, again, I think it's in everyone's interest for the advanced economies to say, okay, you've been making these points. Come to the table now. Uh, let's get these reforms done and show us what you want to do. Um, in your book, you talk a lot about uh, Latin America. And uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, with uh, some uh, colleagues of mine at a meeting uh, in Mexico City. And I could really see how vibrant, you know, how many initiatives the Latin Americans are pursuing. And, uh, you know, the kind of uh, uh, Latin America we see today is completely different from the Latin America that was experimenting failures. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, you know, successes out of their own failures, uh, which you describe very effectively in your book. Uh, and that said, you know, uh, still Latin America has two countries in the G20. That's Argentina. Mexico and even uh, and, and Brazil, so it's actually uh, three countries. But uh, you know, what is a sense? I mean, what is their agenda? Because you know, they sit in the G20. This is a premier forum for international economic cooperation. But uh, um, you know, in the end, I'm not quite sure that uh, there is a Latin America agenda where they are trying to leverage on this global fora, as for instance, you know, the U.S. or maybe even China has been trying to do. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good point. And I think there is, at the moment, a certain amount of disharmony and disorganization amongst not just Latin America, but developing countries generally as to what their agenda should or needs to be. Now, you may ask the question, you may say, well, if they're, if they're not organized, well, what business do they have at the table? But again, I think they're two sides of that story. Extending responsibility, I think, will catalyze countries to force them to figure, well, okay, we're, if we're going to get two more seats in the IMF board, what do we want to do with those seats? And the absence of that kind of responsibility, um, it allows this sort of um, kicking down the road of the can of actually getting their act together to really think about what, what is it that we want? Is it that we want greater communication from advanced economies on monetary policy in advance so that we don't get hit with um, you know, taper tantrums? Is it that we want um, real reform on, 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 on agricultural issues in, in, in advanced economies, particularly the United States and in, and in Europe uh, for Doha? It's, it's, it's up to them, but they, but, they need, but they need to figure out what their agenda is, because we shouldn't tell them what, what their agenda ought to be. Um, but I think extending that responsibility could be an important catalyst, as you, as you allude to, in forcing them or, or to, to actually deliver on their end of the social contract. Um, you know, you mentioned a number of times uh, the IMF, uh, the, the IMF governance reforms or lack of reforms. And we talked about uh, the, the current deadlock in the U.S., in the U.S. Congress, and, and, and therefore, uh, you know, what this implies for uh, those emerging economies. But actually, you know, when uh, we talk about the IMF, uh, we know that the uh, head of this institution has invariably been a Western European which is clearly at odds with uh, you know, the word economy that you describe in your book. And yet, you know, when we talk about China uh, you know, being the second largest economy in the world, when we talk about the BRICS, um, you know, the latest uh, selection uh, of the IMF managing director, um, you know, there were some advanced economies, and you know, we are in Canada, and I understand Canada was one of those, that actually supported a candidate from um, an emerging economy, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Karstens from Mexico. Yes. In the end, you know, China, India, other emerging economies uh, did support, uh, you know, the Western European candidates. So I think if, uh, you know, you are China, you are 
we know that China is never going to borrow from the IMF in the coming years uh, for, uh, for various reasons, one being that the IMF doesn't have the financial capacity anyway to lend to China. So what it takes you know, for China to say, look, from this moment onwards, I'm going to try to sell my own rules of the game, and I'm not going to vote for a candidate from Western Europe as it has been from 1946 till now. Yes, I don't know what China will do, but I think your, your point about um, the head of the IMF and look, and anybody can, can you can all you know agree to disagree about extraordinary candidates. There are some extraordinary candidates to put forth the job, and Christine Lagarde is an exceptional head of the IMF. Um, but your point is that's not the is that that's not the point. The point is what's the, what's the process, and. It's true that there was, again, another example of, if you will, sort of disorganization amongst emerging markets in the process, because they could, if they could have got, all gotten behind a candidate, there might have been, there might have been a different outcome. Um, so I do think that um, uh, there's a lot of soul searching that has to happen uh, amongst the leadership in emerging economies to say, well, what is it that we would want to do? Uh, who would our candidate be? And you might come to the conclusion that it might be a Western European, in fact, right? But as we all know, whether it's in countries or companies or think tanks or any other organization, people can accept almost any outcome as long as the process has integrity and as long as they feel as though there was real voice and input into that process. And I think that's really what's at stake. And I think um, advanced economies need to think about that. But I think on the other side, emerging markets also need to think about, again, what do we really want? What do we want to do with this increased voice? And what, and what would the ideal candidate or process look like from our point of view if we could design this from scratch? Uh, let me uh, put you on something. Uh you know, on something else. Uh, so clearly, the G20 was a big uh, governance innovation, uh, especially its elevation to the leaders' level. That was a quick way of integrating uh, emerging economies into global governance processes. Because we have seen that reforming treaty-based organizations, of course, takes considerable time. But we have also seen that, you know, the G20 reached its uh, effectiveness, its apex, uh, let's say at the London summit of right. 2009, then I would also include the Pittsburgh summit of September 2009. But then from that moment onwards, the G20 effectiveness uh, has, uh, uh, has been fading. And, uh, you know, since a few days, Australia has, um, um, you know, has become the new chair of the G20. What do you think it would take, you know, to revitalize, to revitalize the G20, to make it uh, a more attractive forum? Um, you know, do we need uh, a country that is more a kind of honest broker like Australia between the East and the West? Uh, do we need a country that uh, is more um, sort of, uh, is very effective at engaging the US and China in the G20, more than say Russia has been in the context of its own presidency? So in other words, what would you suggest to the Australians who are taking over the new presidency of the G20 uh, to make this forum uh, more effective from the viewpoint of the global governance, but also from the viewpoint of the emerging economies, which are members of the G20? Yeah, so I think the G20 needs to have some more, some more teeth. And I don't know exactly how you do this, but <clears throat> if you think about uh, the G20 process uh, and some parallels between that and let's say a debt renegotiation process, where if a country is uh, in default on its debt um, or is having trouble servicing its debt and they're a group of, large group of, of, of external bondholders, what organizations like the International Monetary Fund are able to do is basically say, well, we're not gonna have negotiations held up by a few small bondholders who are holding out for um, uh, an unreasonably large uh, share of the pie. And in a G20 context, you have a situation where you know, a few large members of the G20 have undue influence 
or sometimes not even large members, to, to, to keep the process from moving forward. So I think you need some sort of mechanism where you're giving countries voice, but there's a decision rule that allows you to move forward uh, so that the process can have some, have some, have some more teeth. Um, so in the case of, you know, the, the IMF reform case would be a, a good example. You have a, a maj vast majority of the G21 and move forward on this issue, but one country being a part of the process. So you may have better ideas as to actually how that, what the mechanism for that would look like, because you've written a lot about this. Um, I don't have the specific mechanism, but I, but I know that we need to, I mean, it's undermining the, the credibility of the G20. Uh, you know, still uh, uh, pushing you uh, on the G20. Uh, clearly, you know, if we compare the G20 with the G7, G8, there is no doubt this was um, a huge step forward yep. in global governance. Uh, this is the only systemic forum that includes both advanced and emerging economies. And there is no other systemic forum that is cross-cutting uh, across advanced and emerging economies at the same time. And yet it's only 19 countries. So, uh, you know, if you take uh, the IMF membership, right now there are 188 countries and there are still a few that are uh, not members of the IMF yet. Uh, so how can the G20 become more legitimate? Um, should the G20 evolve towards a kind of constituency mechanism uh, like, uh, you know, on the IMF board, where say, you know, Canada, for instance, on the IMF board represents a number of yep. countries like the Caribbean, uh, Ireland, uh, Brazil also represents a number of other countries. Or should the G20 members engage more effectively in consultations with their own regional uh, um, and neighbors? Um, I mean, because this is really uh, very difficult to square because on the one hand, you wanna have a relatively a small number of members sitting at the table to preserve effectiveness, especially in a crisis context. But on the other hand, uh, I think, you know, without consensus and legitimacy, and you point out in your book very well, without ownership, right. you know, there is no forum that is going to be effective. Well, I think the combination, again, it's a combination of voice and decision rule. So you can have a, a mechanism by where one country is effectively representing a group of countries, right? And that allows voice in the process if that, if that country is representing the views of the group of countries, you know, if it's Canada representing 15 countries, for instance, in a, very, in a, in a, in a, in a way that's faithful to uh, the, the, the interests of those members. But then we get back to the kind of the, the bondholder question, which is, you know, you need, a, you need a, a, a rule by which you're gonna then move forward and make decisions. Because if you allow every single bondholder or country uh, to have equal weight in some sense in forestalling decisions, then you have, you're waiting for a consensus that's never gonna happen. So you need some combination of voice, but then once discussions have been had, and we all agree that that process is a fair process by which dissenters can express their views, then you need a, a mechanism to move, to move forward. So using the categories or the lessons that I've done from your book, you need to be a little bit pragmatic. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you very much, Peter. I think uh, we could uh, open up uh, to the audience and see whether there are any questions. We... Um, so there is a microphone over there. There is another microphone on my right, right hand side. I would invite you to, uh, you know, to uh, state your name and uh, affiliation, please. Hi, um, my name is Peter Mueller, and uh, um, I'm an independent analyst. Um, wondering your thoughts about uh, one element that would apply in unison to any, um, both emerging country, um, first world country, in terms of the hand they're dealt with demographics and what role that plays in your view 
uh, moving forward with, um, specifically when, when we look at uh, the Western nations having an older population and therefore having a, a different set of um, necessary priorities in, in dealing with their populations on many levels versus the emerging markets that have generally a younger population representing a, a different level of drive and effort and uh, a, a, a desire to build, if you will. Uh, and I'm just wondering your thoughts on demographics and the role that that plays. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Peter. Uh, love the name, by the way. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, demographics certainly has an impact on economic uh, development. And you know, what, to take the discipline framework, you know, what, what discipline is going to mean for you is going to depend very much on what your demographic structure looks like. So for countries that are aging and have to deal with uh, essentially a, a slow-growing slow grow, labor force, well, one of the key questions that's going to come up, whether it be in Japan or uh, countries of Western Europe, is what's your stance going to be on immigration? Uh, because if you have a slow-growing labor force uh, and a rapidly growing uh, retiree population, for instance, uh, for whom you need to provide both services but also resources, uh, if you're not willing to embrace immigration, uh, well, then you're going to have to be willing to li live with lo lower living standards. So that's one of the trade-offs I think that, that, that slow-growing societies are going are to have to face. And then for uh, emerging economies that are generally much younger uh, and have rapidly growing labor forces, well, the key issue there then is making sure that you're educating workers and providing um, the kind of environment where employment opportunities are going to be sufficient to absorb uh, a, a rapidly, rapidly growing labor force. So uh, what discipline is going to mean and what your priorities are going to be are going to be very much dependent, as you say, on what, uh, what the demographic factors are in your country. Thank you. So we have another, we have another question. Yes. Um, my name is Bob Thomas and I'm from Southern Ontario, but I have been um, a project manager for an NGO that has had projects in Latin America. So I've been going to Brazil primarily since 1991 and I've followed some of the progress in Brazil and very interested in Latin America. But um, coming back to the three points that you raise, um, and don't get me wrong because we have many American friends, but frankly, I don't see trust, clarity, or any of these concepts in American policy. And um, I'm just wondering if the, some of the underdeveloped or less developed emerging economies are going to just bypass some of the institutions. I mean, Brazil is now talking, I think it's with South Africa, about forming some sort of a monetary uh, group. And of course, Bolivia and Iran and Venezuela are much more involved with each other than perhaps is wise, China is very involved, and South America has, a, has its own trade agreements among themselves with Mercosur. So I'm just wondering if down the road, rather than the existing institutions accepting, as long as the U.S. has a veto, I just don't see that happening. I'm wondering if some of these emerging economies are going to say, we'll develop our own institutions and organizations. I don't know. It's, a, it's an excellent point, and as you, as you say, we're already beginning to see some of that happening. Um, my own preference would be that I think the, the institutions that have been around for some time do have uh, some real legitimacy, even with challenges, and there is a wealth of historical knowledge in these institutions about how to bring about uh, certain kinds of global cooperation. So it would be my view that we're better off um, if we don't see this kind of fragmentation that we're, we're, we're starting to see and in danger of, of, of encouraging, if institutions like the IMF, the G20, the World Bank, uh, the WTO, and so on, do, do not do a better job of delivering the kind of voice uh, and, and decisiveness that, that Domenico was, was, was alluding to. Uh, but you're certainly right. I mean, right now in the United States, there's a lack of, there's a lack of discipline. We talked about fiscal policy. There's also a lack of clarity. It's, just, it's, no, it's no more complicated than seeing that uh, we've got uh, expansionary monetary policy and contractionary fiscal policy in the United States. The same holds true for Western Europe. So, uh, yes, we need 
advanced nations to re-embrace, relearn these principles that they've taught the rest of the world. Because if they don't do that, we're going to see, as you say, the danger of increasing fragmentation. Um, and it sends the message that, in fact, uh, discipline, clarity, and trust can be bypassed when, in fact, history tells us that they can't be. Is it a danger of fragmentation, or would it be an advantage to create other institutions? Well, again, I think the key thing is avoiding, most specifically, a mentality of, 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 of zero-sum outcomes. Because if you get into, if you begin thinking that, well, gee, um, if I'm Brazil and you know Indonesia is devaluing their currency, well, gee, I need to devalue my currency so that I can compete with them, and that, and that sets off you know what we call beggar thy neighbor devaluation policy, and so you can very quickly, and and Domenico made a very good point. You think about what's, what's China's role in the global economy. Well. There's a big difference between being China and Barbados, right? If you're a country like Barbados and they didn't devalue the currency, but if they decided to go down that route, the repercussions for the rest of the world are very small because Barbados is very small. If China makes a decision that it's not going to allow its currency to, to float or to appreciate in value, even as its, its, economy, its economy becomes stronger, that has a big systemic effect on the rest of the world. Or if Europe as a whole, uh, the world's largest economy, if you take Europe as a whole, decides to all pursue fiscal, all those countries decide to pursue fiscal austerity at once, that is a huge multiplier effect on the rest of the world. And so my point is that fragmentation, zero-sum thinking, will it may be innocuous for a few small countries to do that? when it begins to gain critical mass for larger countries in blocks can be very dangerous uh, to the world economy. That's precisely why um, uh, post-World uh, post, post War II, we formed institutions to try to prevent the kinds of um, zero-sum policies that, that uh, drove the world economy to the brink. Uh, Peter. Uh Actually, we have also an online audience who's following us uh, through webcast. And we have a, you can see that we are in Canada. Canada is traditionally uh, strongly advocated for a more inclusive uh, uh, global governance. And we have a question from Deb. She's asking uh, you, how could Canada play a stronger leadership role in supporting inclusion of developing nations? in global economic conversations. And I think this uh, question is more a kind of follow-up on your book. Um, and maybe, you know, you may want to uh, elaborate on that. Yeah. I think that, let me speak in general terms, I think, you know, China, I mean, it's not China, Canada uh, is an enormously respected country. Uh, um, Canada is considered, I think, a very honest broker. And Whereas there are larger economies in the world, um, I think Canada has the potential to play an outsized role in these conversations precisely because of its credibility and because it is seen as, seen as being an honest broker. And so where Canadian officials to um, decide there's in, in Canada's enlightened self-interest or broader global self-interest uh, to really push an agenda, and that, that would have to be an agenda that was crafted out of many conversations about what would be the, uh, the most helpful set of two or three things to push for, for developing countries. I think uh, Canada could play a significant role. Do you, I don't know what's, what's your view. No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and, you know, of course, Canada did play a leading political as well as intellectual role in establishing the G20 yes. uh, towards uh, uh, the end of the 90s. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think I, one can safely say that CG also intellectually contributed to underscore the need for elevating the G20 to the leaders' level, which was eventually uh, acknowledged by um, the G20 leaders and, and uh, uh, you know, the rest is history of these days. Uh, but I have another question from David Campthorne of CG. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
I guess for me, just to turn it around um, a little bit in terms of... Pardon the pun. <laughs> what, what are the lessons um, of the third world for the third world going forward? You know, we, we look at China, we see Brazil, uh, China's facing its own internal imbalances problems, um, as well as, you know, Brazil facing inflation problems right now. And so in terms of the three lessons of developing nations, you know, Got for it. the first world, you know, what are these lessons for them in terms of bringing it back? Two lessons come to mind immediately. Uh, number one, avoid disaster. I didn't talk very much tonight about my home country of Jamaica, but Jamaica in the early 1970s uh, began a series of economic experiments under the government of, of Michael Manley. It was an set of experiments um, with nationalization of industry, closing the economy to free trade, uh, reckless spending that put the economy in essentially a 15 year tailspin. Uh, the economy contracted for, contracted for almost 15 straight years in Jamaica. So that was a real economic disaster. And what we learned from uh, third world countries is that the path into a crisis is not nearly as steep as the path out of a crisis. It's a lot harder to recover, as in with many things in life. So avoiding disaster is rule number one. And it sounds uh, almost too trite to say, but we've seen it over and over again. Uh, it's very hard to create an economic miracle. It's very easy to create economic disasters in government, but it also, it's, it's also easy to avoid them, right? Don't run deficits that are very large for long periods of time. Don't print money to finance the deficit and, and generate inflation. Don't nationalize industries in order to redistribute income. Um, and ironically, there's a very interesting uh, article in the New York Times today about the, Nelson Mandela having learned this lesson uh, very quickly uh, uh, after he became uh, president through conversations he had with actually other third world countries who basically said, you have, no, you have no business talking about nationalization. So first thing, avoid disasters. Uh, second thing, stay the course. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not very exciting to say that um, uh, the key to, to economic growth is, is, is stability, openness, uh, reducing costs of doing business. Um, that's not as exciting as um, coming up with a, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar idea of, for a uh, new technological park or some kind of quick win that the government's going to do. But actually just creating just an environment in which it's... Uh, firms have the incentive to invest. Uh, students have uh, the means and incentive to, to go to school because they, they feel as though there's going to be a, a, an environment in which jobs are going to be created. Um, an environment in which there's an incentive to basically invest in physical human capital. Those things really matter. And if they've worked for 25 years, keep going. Thank you. Samantha Santamando of CG. Hi, Peter. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question about uh, third world lessons for the advanced economies, but in this case, the advanced economies are new to these problems. So there's a common problem in developing and emerging economies where there's brain drain, often because there's a lack of job availability. And now in the Eurozone crisis, there's also being a problem of brain drain in the Euro periphery. So have there been um, policies that the emerging and developing economies have pioneered in terms of retaining these um, these citizens that have a lot of human capital, have, have they pioneered pol policies in retaining these individuals and can the Euro periphery learn from these policies to help decrease fragmentation in Europe? I think there are lessons. I mean, we see very clearly um, in environments in which uh, policies um, basically make it hard for young people and, or skilled people in general to reap the fruits of their investment in their own human capital, um, people vote with their feet when they can. Um, you know, the example of uh, in 1978 uh, or 1977, uh, going back to the Michael Manley example again, Michael Manley made a speech uh, on national television 
in uh, the, the, the national stadium of Jamaica where he basically said, uh, Jamaica has no room for millionaires. If you want to be a millionaire, there are five flights a day to Miami. And guess what happened? What leaders say matter. People left the country. You know, my family actually left soon after. My parents didn't want to be millionaires, but they wanted to be able to get lab equipment to do their experiments. So the best thing that governments can do in Europe to avoid brain drain is to address labor market reform. Because right now you have a situation in, 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 um, <clears throat> in Europe in which insiders, people who work, are able to do so to the great expense of those who want to work. So uh, making it easier to hire and fire workers so that firms uh, have greater incentive to hire workers uh, will be a great step in the right direction. So uh, they're very basic policy decisions that can be made uh, to make it easier to, to hire and fire workers and to create more flexible labor markets that will go a long way. But those are policy choices that actually, again, require discipline because there are winners and losers um, involved with that. And so I really think that uh, governments can actually make a big difference. And if you, you need to look no further than, um, than countries like, I, I gave the, example, the negative example of, of Jamaica, but the positive example is in countries like India uh, that have made tremendous strides over the last 20 years, you are now seeing some reverse flow of people going back to countries like India, wanting to uh, work and set up businesses because it's a viable environment in which to do so again. Again, not without challenges. So that's, again, the lesson of stay the course to continue make it an even more uh, friendly place to work and do business. Um, but I think the lessons are very clearly there for, for first world governments to, to, to learn if they'll just pay attention to the last 30 years. Sure. Thank you. Um, Peter, um, actually I have uh, you know, one uh, more question for you. Uh, the book came out uh, literally a few months ago, it's very updated. <coughs> but uh, you know, as it always happens when you write books, uh, there is always a last chapter that is missing. So you know, what is really the title? Can you summarize for us what is the last chapter that you didn't manage to include in this book? <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. <clears throat> the chapter that I wish I could have written, um, but don't know yet how to write, is how do leaders actually get it done? So I mentioned an example, you know, when, 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 when discipline things happen, like they have, you know, I give the example of Barbados. Um, you mentioned China in the case of pragmatism. What are the lessons that you can glean across examples of leaders who have been able to be disciplined? Uh, and I'm, in particular, I'm interested in thinking about leaders in a democratic context. How do you get it done? And because that's the question that I get all the time. You know, you know what's, what does the United States have to do to get back on track? Um, so I, this book has ex really kind of explained the what, I think, in a reasonably coherent way. But the how in a domestic context, I mean, I talk about the how in an international context. I think part of the how in an international context is this business of humility and greater inclusiveness. But in a domestic context, the how is very, very hard. And I would like to be able to say more about how leaders can do that. All right, so maybe we have to wait for your next book. Um, <laughs> My wife says you're going to have to wait a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Peter. I would call on Fred uh, to give you a formal uh, note of thanks on behalf of CG. Thank you, Veneka. Yes, thank you, Peter, for your uh, very uh, challenging and interesting lecture this evening, and to Domenico for his excellent moderation of the uh, conversation and the questions. Uh, you spoke about the lessons of discipline, clarity, and trust. 
um, that uh, were described in your book, the, the lessons of these policies for creating growth, the need for nations to, uh, to rise together in this growth, and especially the need for uh, political will in the domestic economy to support these policies that foster trust. Uh, those are lessons well taken, and they apply to the big players, and uh, those are the ones that will have the most impact in the global economy. Uh, so those are very important lessons for the entire world, and we thank you for those insights tonight. Thank you. An edited video of this evening's live webcast will be posted to the CG website. You can share it with your friends there. We'll also post a blog about this event where you can add your own comments and continue this conversation. Also, uh, this excellent book, Turnaround, which has received a lot of praise and does a great job of walking you through the issues of the global economy today, can be purchased in our lobby today at a special price of $30, which includes tax. And uh, Dr. Henry will be outside signing those books, if you like. Our next two public events in the CG Auditorium will be in the new year. On Wednesday, January 22nd, we welcome David Keith, Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, to discuss the case for geoengineering, uh, climate geoengineering. And on Wednesday, January 22nd, we present John Ibbotson, a Globe and Mail journalist who's joining CG as a senior fellow for one year while he takes a leave of absence from the newspaper to write a bi biography of our Prime Minister Stephen Harper. John will be speaking on what he calls the Harper Doctrine, a conservative foreign policy revolution. So be sure to register for our events newsletter for information on all of our upcoming lectures, including our CG Cinema series. Thank you again for coming to CG this evening and have a safe journey home. <laughs>